I'm very happy today to have with us in Bolivar Hall in London, G.B. Tamas, Gaspar Tamas, a very distinguished philosopher from Hungary who has written extensively about both Hungary, Eastern Europe, and many other themes that affect the world today. The remarkable thing about G.B. Tamas is that he has been a dissident in Eastern Europe, both under the communist regimes, uh, when it was not easy to be so, and today, when it's equally difficult to be a dissident and challenge what is happening in Eastern Europe today. Gaspar, tell us a bit first about your own background. I grew up in Romania. I belong to the Transylvanian Hungarians, uh, a minority, large minority group there. And uh, I had to leave Romania in 1978 because of various unpleasant things that happened to people of an independent cast of mind there. So, but I didn't want to leave Eastern Europe, so I uh, settled in Hungary and I taught at the university for a very short time before I was sacked for my convictions and my uh, ideas. But uh, in a way, my itinerary was quite typical for my intellectual generation, um, at least for a while, because we all went from left to right. And we started off <clears throat> on the left, most of us, and of a critical left, which was passionately hated by the authorities. And uh, it was uh, started from an egalitarian social criticism of a system that pretended to be exactly that, socially just and liberating, which it wasn't. And therefore, dissidents started by actually calling uh, the system on, on its own original founding ideas. Before, we, before yes. we go into that, I'd like to know a bit about your parents. What was your, your background, your class background, your intellectual background? My parents were communists uh, who participated in the old illegal movement and in the resistance, both spent long years in prison before 1945. And my father was a writer and an editor and a lot of local theater. Uh, my mother worked in a hospital and, um, you know, there were people whose best friends and associates and family members have been exterminated in 1944 uh, for having participated in the resistance. And uh, so they came from a very heavy uh, revolutionary past. But they were also Jews? No, just my mother. Your mother was Jewish? My father wasn't. <clears throat> but she, she survived? She was not taken to the camps? Uh, paradoxically, she survived unlike her family, because she was in prison as a communist. <laughs> they were, belonged to that enthusiastic anti-fascist generation, uh, hoped uh, for a new dawn for humanity in the 40s, and confronted with the Stalinist system, uh, you know, they were disenchanted and heartbroken about it all, especially you know, in the spring of 56, when the crimes of Stalin have been, of course, uh, unmasked by the 20th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party. And uh, they were disappointed and bitter people when I grew up, who kept their ideas, but had a very low opinion of the so-called socialist reality. And this was my education. But you, you were saying to me earlier, before we started recording, that your mother had said something very profound to you, in effect. Yes, in well, she days. said in the late 90s, uh, in her ironical manner, that when I was already heartbroken myself about our own disappointments, said that every generation deserves its own disappointments. Ours was, she said, disappointment in real socialism, 
and yours is in the disappointment in real democracy, real bourgeois democracy. And yeah, well, it's a sad sentence, but it has its truth. Let us now get to Eastern Europe today. Uh, the situation in Hungary, uh, not that it's reported in the Western media that regularly, if at all, but it seems to be pretty dire. There's a right-wing nationalist government in power. On its right, there's a fascist organization called Jobbik. And the EU is quite prepared to accept this because it suits their interests. They even patronize Orban, the, the, the uh, Hungarian prime minister. Juncker gives him a playful fascist salute when he arrives at meetings. I mean, what the hell is going on? So quite apart from the uh, shallowness and superficiality and irresponsibility of the EU leaders known to all, um, of course they would not uh, be very harsh about a state that pays its debts, that introduces the flat tax, that liquidates almost completely any kind of social assistance, may scrap unemployment benefit altogether, uh, which has the most oppressive labor code in the whole of Europe. Uh, it's basically impossible to strike, and so on and so forth. So it's a quiet country, socially. It's a quiet country. There's no resistance. There's no independent judiciary. There is a totally fraudulent electoral law that uh, will assure the triumph of the right forever and ever and ever. Um, you know, scrapping the powers of local authorities, um, you know, obligatory work for uh, the indigent, and so on and so forth. So it's a very harsh and uh, what I call ethnicist, not even nationalist, as much worse than that, uh, regime that uh, keeps the population under very strong control. So it's really uh, in a country in a very, very, very dire economic and social uh, situation. But the victims of this uh, are not even aware that there is a possible political formulation of their problems and grievances. Uh, word doesn't reach them. It's you know, even state media is broadcasting, uh, you know, crappy music. That's basically it, depoliticizing. So the system has reached a point at which extreme right-wing mobilization has been stopped. Now it's the turn of depoliticization to happen. It's a very quiet country. It's a very quiet country. And which now, with the coming of the... Uh, uh, migration crisis with so-called illegal migrants uh, streaming in through the Serbian border. That, of course, was the occasion for which the government was waiting in, in order to create a xenophobic and ethnicist and racist consensus. And they're quite successful, not totally, but quite successful in this. So, for example, uh, human rights groups that are trying to feed the exhausted migrants arriving in the country and give them a bottle of water and a sandwich and, you know, a sanitary napkin or something. They are attacked by, by far-right groups with batons and uh, sticks and all that. It's very dangerous to go uh, to the railway stations to, to, to help migrants. It is very dangerous. Tamás, how does this compare to uh, the rest of Eastern Europe. It's a difference of degree rather than uh, in kind. And uh, similar phenomena can be found elsewhere too, but in not such a thick concentration. And also, uh, the Hungarian regime has a certain influence. Um, you can find not only in Eastern Europe, but on German websites. I've just read before coming to London an article in Die Welt, a German newspaper, uh, reporting on the anti-immigrant measures of the Hungarian government, with thousands of comments saying that this is a real politician. 
Such a chancellor would we need. He just says what millions of Germans think. Uh, his popularity is, is enormous in Austria and in other places. Huge demonstrations in Slovakia about the white Slovakia and such like, which goes against immigrants and the Roma minority. At the same time, in some countries, especially in former Yugoslavia, you uh, can see new left groups mushrooming and, and trying to sort of conquer the divide. You see uh, the sons and daughters of those who were shooting at one another in the 1990s to be friends and to cooperate politically and culturally and so on and so forth in the ex-Yugoslavia. So of course there are all sorts of phenomena, not all going in the same direction, but the ruling classes and the political establishment is solidly on the right under whatever official colouring that might be. It's, it is sort of ironical, to put it mildly, Gaspar, that the European Union, which was designed to unite Europe, actually the Euro European currency, the way in which the EU functions today, has exacerbated the divisions within Europe. How do you explain this? Europe wasn't designed consciously and deliberately in order to favor the rich center of the European Union, but that has been the result. And uh, it is quite obvious that the European Union is going towards a two-tier uh, solution in which the core countries, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, Denmark, etc. France. France, maybe, uh, will, will uh, form a center and keep the uh, troublesome East Europeans and other poor people aside. But also there's a genuine sense of uh, unfair deals and imposed injustice and such like, and a disappointment the European Union has meant for East Europeans two things, either working in multinational companies in East European countries for a very low wage, or emigrating to Western Europe and to Britain to work for equally low wages, which are still higher than the wages at home. So, um, so poverty, destitution, authoritarian government, disintegration of all social systems, decay of education, culture, and all that has been the result of the great democratic hopes of 89. I hate to admit, having been uh, an adversary of the former regime, that many institutions worked much better and much in a much fairer fashion, I mean, a much more comprehensive education. There's been cheap, high culture for everybody. It has been a bookish, conservative society, of course, free medicine for everybody, free healthcare for everybody. We have an education system that is more selective than the British one, which is something. Free schooling and all that has meant, of course, that there are quite a few high quality schools, church schools too, for the middle classes, for the upper middle classes, and the rest is unspeakable. And this is throughout Eastern uh, yes, yes, throughout Eastern Europe, indeed. How would you describe the state of culture? Because in the old days, under the communist regimes, whatever their other defects, you did have a very high level of cinema often being produced. There were theatr theatrical innovations, in, certainly in uh, Czechoslovakia and Poland. I don't know so much about Hungary. Well, first of all, is that you know, most of the intelligentsia and uh, of the cultural scene have been against the authoritarian governments and regimes in Eastern Europe. And because most of the culture had been, of course, sponsored and supported by the state, it was very easy to uh, clamp down on them. The famous Hungarian films you see still in festivals, not in cinemas, are mostly produced by foreign uh, companies and foreign capital and so on and so forth. The greatest Hungarian film director, Béla Tarr, has finished his film career. Béla Tarr is now teaching. Where does he teach? Well, you know, he emigrated from uh, Hungary to free Bosnia. He's teaching in Sarajevo. 
language. Well, there's freedom of speech in Bosnia, unlike in Hungary. That sounds crazy, but it is the case. Most of our artists and dramatic groups will appear in international festivals and, and galleries and exhibitions. And uh, the uh, publishers are being kept alive by foreign royalties uh, issuing from translations. The Hungarian state, the Hungarian society cannot uh, support Hungarian culture and the state is not helping at all. The situation is now worse than in Texas. Uh, the same I myself am writing my, my theoretical studies in English, am I not? You are. And <clears throat> is this because it would be virtually impossible for you to be published in Hungarian? No, you no, could be but, but for such complex writings to find an audience, uh, it's really impractical to write in Hungarian because it won't reach an audience. And there are less and less reviews and periodicals and so on. Of course, I can post everything on the internet, but there's no, no <clears throat> such an intellectual community <coughs> that will receive such things, unlike in countries like Romania or Serbia or even Russia and Turkey. Are you saying, uh, uh, Gaspar, that the situation in Romania on this level is much better than Hungary? Incomparably better. It's and it's better, better than in the Czech Republic. Eastern Europe is now much better than Central Europe. Hmm. The uh, countries like you know, Slovakia or Hungary or the Czech Republic are culturally arid, Poland, culturally arid. Much more interesting things are going on in the Balkans and in Russia. Uh, under a harsh authoritarian regime, uh, still the indomitable spirits who are producing very interesting and very brave things. Yeah, and, but what about Romania, which is an interesting, because it was so repressed under Ceausescu, yes. that when the regimes that followed Ceausescu came, for a while it appeared to be a desert again, of yes. a different sort, but there's been a revival? Yes, also, also in the first... Uh, decade and a half, let's put it that way, there was a sort of a renaissance of, of Romanian culture, especially in cinematography. Very good films have been made, indeed excellent ones. <clears throat> but uh, the ideological life and the press and the media, and social science, social commentary and so on and so forth, have been so conservative and sometimes uh, even close to the 30s, extreme right, which had a very great tradition in Romania. Well, think of Eliade and Sioran and these people. And uh, <clears throat> all of a sudden, around the, in the new millennium, a new generation of intellectual has, intellectuals has appeared, most of them on the left, amazingly enough. <clears throat> in my native town, I don't live in longer, there are two Marxist publishing houses. Well, it would be unthinkable to have one in the whole country, in the whole uh, area of, of, of former Austro-Hungarian Empire. So, uh, excellent periodicals, excellent actions, gatherings, uh, book publishing, etc. How do you explain this? This is explained partly of the propensity of young uh, uh, Romanian intellectuals to study abroad and go back. And they were <clears throat> looking for inspiration in uh, radical scholarship and theory in the West. And instead of uh, settling in the West, they returned and tried to do their own thing, and they succeeded in doing that. And there's also a great academic proletariat in, in Romania, which is not the case in other countries, where uh, the numbers have been restricted in, in, in what universities. What do you mean by academic proletariat? I mean a great number of students without any prospects of for work. jobs. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But when there is a, a high number of uh, people with uh, uh, high culture, a lot of learning and social discontent, that of course is a, is a fertile ground for radical attitudes to be shaped among those people. And also the deep social crisis of the country contributed to this. So, for example, there's even a very corrupt, but nevertheless more popular-minded government at the moment, 
which will be just kicked out by the anti-corruption campaign now, that, for example, tried to create a, a fairer tax system, something that Central European countries wouldn't dream of. This is a sign of hope that the young generation in Romania has done this, because if Romania, why not Poland? Why not Slovakia? Why not the Czech Republic? Uh, I can't tell you why not, but at the moment it doesn't seem to be, to be, to be the case. And, uh, and of course, uh, ex-Yugoslavia and Greece with the anti-fascist traditions have always been different. So, of course, traditions matter. Yes. So, you know, uh, every day I am reminded in Hungary that this country was an Axis power. You cannot f forget that. Explain. Well, sometimes it's very simple. All the figures of the wartime governments rehabilitated streets named the after The figures them. who collaborated with the Nazis. Well, they were themselves pretty fascist, so they were welcoming, not collaborating, celebrating. Uh, by official government spokesmen, the participation of the Hungarian army in the Second World War called to be a noble task, as it was an anti-communist crusade and all that kind of thing. Uh, the gendarmerie, which was declared in '46 as being a collective war criminal, rehabilitated and its memory celebrated. Every day there is something of this, of this sort, so you cannot forget it. So, and, and the Prime Minister will, will, will say that Hungary has lost the war. I mean, what? Not even Germany will say that Germany has lost the war. Well, of course, it hasn't won the war, but defeat was combined with liberation. And the same attitudes can be found in many places, in Slovakia, in Croatia sometimes. And so well, so in forth. Croatia, it was very strong yes. uh, during the yes. Yugoslav civil war. Yes, but you know, even in Serbia, you know, Draža Mihailović, yes. the Chetnik leader, has been rehabilitated officially, in, but there have been protests. But against such uh, rehabilitations in Hungary, where condemned war criminals are rehabilitated, and, uh, you know, one of the direst figures in the wartime uh, pro-Nazi governments, who has been a quite respectable historian otherwise, is now officially will be restored to the uh, membership of the Academy of Sciences. What about anti-Semitism? Well, I should be serious about this and, 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 and tell you how awful and how all-pervading it is, but it is at the same time so boring. You know, complaining about anti-Semitism in Hungary, you know, it's about complaining about uh, bad weather in England. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's there. It's there and, of course, it has consequences. Since 2010, of course, uh, the career prospects for Jewish intellectuals have, been, have not been exactly brilliant. So we all know that hundreds of thousands of Hungarians are leaving Hungary, emigrating for better prospects, and people don't really notice how many young Jews are among those people, and uh, leaving in droves. Anti-Semitism is quite accepted, sometimes veiled, sometimes not in the large circulation media, and when people say such a thing in public, such as the leaders of the country, that being on the left is a genetic thing, everybody knows what they have to think about this. And, and they are genetically alien because so the, the left is incapable of representing the national interest because they just don't love us Hungarians, said our Prime Minister. They just don't love us. So a Jew can't be a Hungarian in, in their logic? We, no, not really, not no. really, not really, no. You are I mean, either Jewish or... Hungarians, no. Hungarians are people of Hungarian ethnicity, whether they are citizens of Hungary or not. Being a citizen of Hungar Hungary doesn't make you into Hungarian. It's an ethnic notion, not a civic notion, not a national notion. Amongst the things you said, um, what struck me was the speed with which everything changes. Yes. You know, historical time has become much quicker that Eastern Europe 
you know, a large part of it was very cultured, intelligentsias, a certain level of culture. But don't forget it was always oppressed and always in opposition. Yes. So when people think sentimentally about fin de siècle Vienna and so on and so forth, well, those people were despised by officialdom. Uh, you know, you, you don't think that uh, people like Freud were university professors. It would have been totally impossible. People like the young Gerd Lukács didn't dream of becoming a university professor in Royal Hungary. That would have been totally uh, inconceivable, and not because of his origins and his views, but because of not being that kind of provincial conservative that has been the official culture's line. And so, so there were indeed wonderful things, but always perennially, if you wish, in opposition. It's still the case. So in one, in one respect, so nothing changes. But in another respect, something could change again? Can you visualize something changing for the better, some progressive movements arising over the next decade, say? Well, these things are difficult to predict, uh, but there's only one thing I can tell you honestly. There are quite a few people who are just out of stubbornness and of moral conviction are not giving up. Uh, they don't have a political base, uh, they, don't have a, you know, they don't have a whisper, they don't have a chance of really prevailing even culturally or ideologically, but there's a continuity. There's a continuity which we know from history is important, that you know, all the uh, attitudes of you know, speaking truth to power and all that, is being kept alive even if in a very small place, in a very isolated manner. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I have sometimes very strange experiences because of my previous career when uh, in the first half of the 90s I've been an MP and, um, you know, and permanently on television and so on and so forth. So people know me better than other uh, people of my ilk would be. So, so people talk to me, and uh, people who wouldn't talk to isolated young leftish intellectuals, you know, on the train, on the train station, on the bus stop, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And people are aware that the regime they might even vote for is not theirs. That is unjust, that is unfair. They might vote for it because they are afraid of why do people vote for nationalist governments? Because they're afraid of foreign threats. And so they will vote for, but that doesn't mean that people are blind. They're not. They know how unfair the pension system is and the tax system is, and how, you know, in hospitals you don't have toilet paper, and uh, so on and so forth. They know that. And uh, this is not the fanatic nation under totalitarian rule who can blindly believe in the opposite of reality. This is different. So I think that this uh, sane and mundane and illusionless view of social reality combined with a potent uh, um, leftish movement in principle can link, could link up and change things. At the moment, uh, the political situation is, of course, um, uh, is against this. But, of course, it doesn't have to be forever. And, uh, you know, I, in, in 1988, it seemed to us that the Cold War and the balance of powers between the Soviet Union and the West will continue, well, not forever, but for another decade. And, of course, and, you know, a few uh, days later, you know, I found myself at the front of a huge mass demonstration, which I've never thought I will ever see in Budapest. You know, I didn't organize it. People just asked me to speak. But it was spontaneous. So, you know. All um, that is solid. Yes. Melts into air. Yes, it might. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, thank you very much, Kasper.